Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I think we're waiting for a couple more panelists to join us, but in the meantime, I think we can get started if that works for you, Hugh and, and Rob. Absolutely. Yes, please. I know we have a lot to cover. Um, yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, behalf, on behalf of uh, all of us at the Clinton Foundation, thanks so much for joining us uh, for this special webinar on emergency food distribution and smallholder farmer recovery in Haiti, which, uh, as you know, is co-hosted by Accesso and the Smallholder Farmers Alliance. Um, for those of you who might not be members already of the Clinton Foundation's Haiti Action Network, we have been holding nearly weekly conference calls hosted by Dennis O'Brien at Digicel, um, which have been incredibly useful um, when it comes to sharing transparent information on um, COVID-19 in Haiti. Um, but we also know that uh, due to the breadth of issues covered there, there are really limited opportunities for more in-depth conversations um, such as these. So we're very pleased to be hosting this morning's conversation. Um, before we get started, just a few details on Zoom webinars in case you all aren't familiar with them. Um, if you have a question or a comment for any of our panelists, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And that will allow you to type in your question or comment or ask for, you know, to be called on. And then we will be able to do that. Um, please make sure if you're speaking that you uh, unmute your microphone. And when you're done speaking that you mute your microphone. Uh, so we limit the feedback. And if you have any issues at all with the platform, just send me a direct message or an email and I'll be happy to help you out. So with that said, I will hand it over to Rob Johnson from Accesso, who will be chairing this conversation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Bettina. And, and thanks so much for helping us organize uh, this session. Like you said, the, the sessions uh, with Dennis and, and the larger group have been really helpful. Um, but we felt it was time to, to have a breakout session uh, and to get some of the actors specifically working in this area around the table. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for making the time to join this call. Um, we, what we do know right now with COVID-19 is that it had huge implications on, on the global economy. That global economy was, was fairly healthy at the time um, the pandemic broke out. Um, we, we also know that Haiti was in much worse shape going into this pandemic. And we don't really know yet how COVID-19 will play out in Haiti, but we, what we do know is that Haiti will be facing serious food shortages in, in the months and year to come. Uh, more specifically, um, national ag production was down significantly last year. These are on already low yields, um, and, and domestic agriculture accounts for 40% of Haiti's food needs, so the two are directly correlated. Um, and this doesn't take into consideration the, the impact on um, earnings and jobs that the ag sector has. Um, just this morning, a Miami Herald piece noted that global health authorities were worried that COVID-19 could create more civil unrest uh, in Haiti and that the growing food insecurity in the country will ultimately result in famine. Um, so we're here today to discuss how we can better coordinate and align all of our activities, both linked to distribution of emergency food as well as increased investment in new production. Um, we'll have a number of folks providing specific insights to the current food insecurity situation in Haiti, uh, where it's going, as well as details of their work, and then we're gonna open it up to uh, a Q&A and discussion at the end. Um, briefly before moving on to our first panelist, um, I, I wanna give a quick overview of, of um, our organization in Haiti. Um, that I'm a part of. It's, it's called Accesso. Um, it's a market-driven social agribusiness that we launched in 2014. Um, we've worked primarily in peanuts since we started, but we have expanded to mango, lime, ringa, and a number of other crops. Um, we are market-driven, so we, we work uh, in crops that have a strong formal market demand. We provide a holistic suite of services to about 3,000 farmers in the Central Plateau uh, and the Neep region. Uh, and this includes credit, training, inputs, purchase agreements, aggregation, quality control, delivery of, of uh, products to buyers, um, and, and, and those buyers are in Haiti or abroad. Um, one of the most critical parts of our program um, and, and what we do is, is we provide input credit, and we provided um, close to a million dollars in input credit to date. 
Um, all of this input credit is repaid in production with purchase agreements upon harvest. Um, we operate a nursery uh, that also provides farmers with seedlings and, and, and those farmers then get purchase agreements for the production when the trees hit production. Uh, and we run a, a locally sourced feeding program with the, the Model School Network and the Kellogg Foundation providing about 4,000 students with a peanut-based snack each day. Um, we see a huge opportunity and the premise of our business is really built on the idea of linking local demand to local supply. Um, beyond buyers throughout the country, um, you know, in Port-au-Prince and, and other cities, this also unfortunately uh, often includes the feeding programs uh, around, around Haiti. Um, we do believe um, that formal demand, whether it be a feeding program or, or formal buyers, must be met with um, cost and quality competitive production from, from Haitian farmers. Um, so this ties then back to investments in, in new production um, and more seed going out and, and more support for farmers. Excesso's biggest focus at the moment is continuing to expand um, its input credit program, um, as well as expanding the, the commitments we make to farmers for purchasing when they harvest. So this will eff effectively get more production in the ground and then and give farmers the confidence to uh, produce more and have a market for it. Uh, our biggest concern at this point would really be around, um, you know, that, that there's already not enough production going into the ground, enough seed going into the ground. Um, and we feel that COVID-19 will ultimately result in, in less seed going into the ground, which will make a bad problem even worse. Um, so that's some perspective of, of Excesso and, and um, some context for our session today. Um, next, we're going to be speaking with a number of panelists. Um, and, and I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Raphael Chouinard, the Deputy C Country Director at the World Food Program in Haiti. Uh, Raphael, it'd be great if you could give a quick overview of, of WFP's operations in Haiti and, and, and your thoughts on the, the biggest challenges in the coming months. Thank you, Rob, and, and hello to uh, everybody. Hi, Hugh, and, and I can see some, some friends in the, in the panelists too, so I, I'm glad to, uh, to participate in this webinar. Uh, I think that you, are, you made um, a quick and um, a good summary of the situation and, and the aspect of the of the COVID-19. Just just a very quick overview of the operation of, of, of WFP in, in AD. Um, we are, we run a, a certain number of activities, but the main activities of WFP in AD are emergency response that we can discuss uh, today, uh, school feeding program, including uh, homegrown school feeding. Um, we are, we feed um, an average of 300,000 kids um, per year in, in IIT, some with some partners that I can see that BND, Rob Padberg is, is part of the panelists. Uh, and uh, we have also a resilience project, mainly uh, focusing on the watershed management. And we have also um, uh, capacity strengthening with the government, especially with the MAS, the Minister of Social Affairs especially on the social protection policy. And, and we are currently finalizing this, uh, this policy with the, with the government. It's uh, at the last step of the validation by the government. So we really go from the emergency response to the, the, um, the public policies. Speaking about the current situation in IIT, um, the, the latest report of the CNSA, CNSA is the coordination, the National Coordination for Food Security in ID, depending on the Ministry of Agriculture. The la latest report was dated October 2019, and it was mainly focusing on the result of the PAYLOC, uh, meaning the uh, country lockdown in uh, 2019, and the various year of, of uh, drought that uh, impacted uh, IT agriculture. So already in October 2019, the, um, the, 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 the prediction was to have uh, 4.1 million people in food insecurity in IT and 1.2 million severely um, food insecure. 19 and the various, um, the various parameters that you already mentioned, Rob, um, there is some discussion currently with the CNSA to do another a set of survey and what we call an IPC exercise, which is a picture of the food insecurity in AD in the coming um, two months. It's, it's planned for the moment in, in June to have a new picture. 
but the, the, the preliminary figures are, are speaking about an increase from 1.2 to 1.6 million people severely food insecure in, in Haiti. This is for the global picture and of course what we expect as a result of the COVID-19 is mainly at two levels, the availability of food, meaning that with the disruption of the logistics between the borders at the port, uh, and as you mentioned, with the local um, production, we expect a reduction in the food availability, but we also expect uh, a reduction in the food accessibility, meaning that we expect also, because you've got a reduction of the availability, we expect some inflation and we heard already some disruption in some of the most remote area of the country uh, of the market meaning direct in fact is, uh, is an increase in the in the price of the of the food meaning a reduction of the accessibility for the most vulnerable people and to make a very quick summary because i understand that i've got five minutes of um, of talk and i think that i i am already reaching these five minutes um uh, our current operation, we, are, we, are, um, uh, we plan before the COVID-19 to reach 700,000 uh, people in Haiti. We received the funding for 300,000 uh, people that we are currently feeding through um, our current emergency responses, which is based on a mix between food distribution, in-kind food distribution and cash-based transfer in cash in envelope or e-money meaning through a system such as the um, more cash of digital and we choose this mix of uh, in kind and in cash especially for rural area because it allowed to have um, to um, to have any impact on the on the or disrupt the the, the market and and allow some availability of food and then after to have cash intervention, because when you do significant cash intervention in a local market, you have the risk to impact the inflation on the market. And, and usually the WFP activities in a specific area or in a commune target between 15 and 20% of the, of the population estimated that the most are food uh, insecure. So it's, it's uh, significant and could have an impact if, um, we do not uh, monitor the situation of the, of the market. So currently we are feeding uh, 300,000 people, as I mentioned, mixed between in-kind and in-cash um, uh, uh, activities. In the urban area and peri-urban, usually we do four cycle of in-cash only and do not provide any um, in-kind um, distribution. Uh, voila, for the, for the activities of uh, of WFP in AT and just to link with the local food production, just to, uh, to remind you that um, we do 25% on an average of our um, in-kind purchase uh, locally produced in, in AT, mainly for our school feeding program. Currently the schools are closed. We expect that they reopen as soon as possible to continue our ongoing school feeding and local purchases. But as you mentioned, it has done bit easy in 2019 to do local procurement in Haiti due to the civil unrest and we expect that in the coming few months it won't be easy neither. Um, I guess we will have some, some questions at the end of, um, of the various presentation of the panelists but I am open to any question. Well, oh, thank you so thank much, you so Raphael. Much. And that was that was that was right on time and, and super comprehensive. Just a, a super quick follow up. What what are the crops that you procure locally and what what uh, is mostly imported? Um, there is no production of oil in Haiti, so oil is uh, fully imported. But we are uh, purchasing a lot of rice and uh, and maize meal, and we start to uh, to uh, send some tenders for beans. But beans is really like a, a tiny production. So these are for the main uh, local procurement that we are doing through tenders uh, processes. So usually we, are, we purchase from 500 to 1,000 metric tons of food through this process. On another side, the homegrown school feeding um, procurement that we are doing in a small market, like in the NIP, you mentioned your, your activities in the NIP. And in NIP, we, we, have, um, we purchase locally 
um, uh, fruits and vegetables and rice, everything that is needed and required for our uh, school feeding program are purchased locally, except oil again, oil is not produced in Italy. But the rest for the homegrown school feeding is 100% of the requirement, which are done locally. So we are, have really two, two levels of local, local procurement, the homegrown school feeding with food, vegetables, and, and um, dry uh, cereals, plus the big tenders uh, or where we purchase. We, are, so we, um, we ask the provider to transport the food to our main warehouses there is in Port-au-Prince, Gonaïve, and in the northern part in Capetian. And after we dispatch this in, uh, in our school feeding program. Great, great. No, I'm sure there'll be more follow-up questions uh, when we get to the Q&A and discussion session. So thank you, Raphael, for that, that quick uh, but, but informative overview. Yeah, um, next, we are going to move on to, to um, Marianne Mouton. Uh, who's the country director at Acted Haiti. Um, and and Marianne, it'd be great if you can tell us a little bit about your work um, in, in Haiti and Acted's work in Haiti, uh, as well as you know, a brief overview of, of your views on the current food security challenge and, and how Acted is responding. Hello. Yes, so uh, Acted is, um, is an NGO that uh, develops and implements programs uh, targeting the most vulnerable population. Our approach uh, globally and in Haiti looks beyond the immediate emergency towards uh, longer term livelihood reconstruction and uh, sustainable development. We've been working in Haiti since 2004, particularly in the wash and uh, food security livelihood sectors. And we are very keen to explore how to strengthen this nexus in those sectors. Uh, particularly in working side by side with institutions uh, and the local civil society. So in the past few years, uh, we've been implementing a wide range of intervention from food ration distribution to cash transfer and vouchers for food in times of crisis um, to more holistic and longer term structural programs. So for instance, uh, at the moment with the uh, we are uh, supporting in the Grand Anse uh, department uh, the recovery of economic activity in rural areas uh, and providing support to, um, to livelihood for food security uh, by the upgrading of some key agricultural value chains um, such as uh, cassava uh, and uh, fishing, supporting also income generating activities and uh, village and uh, saving and loans associations in addition to consolidating the health system and strengthening the fight against malnutrition with, uh, with nutrition uh, partners. Uh, also, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that in other countries, we are also very active with a sister organization called IMPACT uh, through a program called REACH to undertake market monitoring and cash feasibility analysis to inform humanitarian partners on their food security and cash interventions. So data is really key to better understand uh, needs and gap in the sector. Uh, my colleague Raphael, I think, summarized quite well uh, the, the current food security challenges in Haiti. Uh, I think this, uh, this food security crisis has several triggers, uh, including the, the very serious economic situation affecting the country, which results in rising uh, commodity prices, the depreciation of the Haitian gourd uh, to the US dollar, but is also linked to several episodes of droughts uh, in the past few years that have been affecting the agricultural production. Recently, the, the situation has worsened uh, with the social political unrest and the deteriorating security condi conditions. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of households today are forced to adopt uh, negative uh, survival strategies, uh, such as decreasing uh, you know, expenses related to health or not, not sending kids to school. Um, today, the, the COVID-19 crisis is, is likely to further the, the impact uh, of food insecurity and lead to a very critical situation. Uh, the population will probably suffer from a reduction in economic activity with loss of employment, loss of purchasing power. Uh, we will see the price of basic food and products and agricultural inputs increase. Uh, particularly, as Rafael mentioned, for rural households, uh, because their livelihoods depend exclusively on, uh, or almost exclusively on agriculture. 
Um, so they will be particularly affected uh, because they will be unable to grow cell crops due to the lack of inputs and labor. Um, and there is still uh, in Haiti a critical issue related to the accessibility of seeds uh, for poor households. Um, in light of this situation and, uh, and following the, the publication of the IPC result last year, uh, as you might know, a group of more than 30 NGOs, uh, the National Coordination for Food Security uh, and the NGO Forum, the CLIO, they drafted and published a press release uh, to warn about the deterioration uh, of the food security situation in Haiti. This appeal was really made to uh, identify the needs uh, that uh, urgently need to be uh, responded to um, by using the most appropriate form uh, and prioritizing the acquisition of local products. Um, so, and also calling for uh, immediate action for prevention and care of people suffering from malnutrition. So we, our aim was also to strongly outline the, the need for reconstruction and development of the livelihoods of this population, especially regarding agricultural production and the strengthening of the surveillance and early warning systems, both for food and social security. So shortly after the, the release of this, um, uh, of this uh, publication, uh, funds were made available uh, and transferred to, uh, to partners such as the WFP, FAO, some NGOs, uh, so to be able to respond to the needs of the, of the population in, in face of crisis and, uh, and emergency, uh, with intervention modality ranging from in-kind distribution uh, to cash transfer. Uh, some partners also have a mixed modality, such as cash and voucher for fresh and uh, local products uh, to further boost uh, local purchase. Um, However, uh, I do believe that this is not enough and we have really to pursue our efforts uh, to bridge this gap to better integrate uh, food emergency response with longer, longer term recovery of the agricultural systems uh, and to strengthen national food system and local markets. Uh, for instance, uh, I think this could be done uh, by favoring the purchase and the production of uh, local seeds instead of turning to international seeds provider, buying food ration items in the local markets. Uh, it's done already, but uh, done even more. Diversifying food rations with local products such as yam and cassava. Uh, continue supporting local school feeding programs, uh, relying on buying fresh and local products. Continue to support local initiatives uh, to promote the work of local farmers uh, and transformation of uh, local products. So those are, I mean, a few examples that, uh, that could be strengthened and put in place. Um, and I do believe that donors and partners uh, must continue their efforts to achieve this, uh, this next six all together. Uh, and we should be aware that the, today the level of funding dedicated to Haiti is very insufficient uh, and will not uh, allow to respond to the largely forgotten and uh, underfunded crisis. So that's, uh, that's all on my side. <laughs> No, thank you very much, Marianne, and, and you know you gave a great overview of your work, but then also we we couldn't agree more with you on on a lot of your points and and what we've seen you know with the crops we specifically work with are that you know a bad harvest leads to less seed and and a lot of times seed is is saved and used um, or the price of seed goes up um, so then you have less production the next year um, and and prices continue to increase, making more and more crops and more and more supply chains vulnerable to substitution by imports. Uh, so, so we fully agree um, that it really does take an effort to, um, to focus on certain value chains and, and um, combine procurement of, of various initiatives to encourage more local production. So thank you so much for that. Um, next, we'd like to, to turn to um, Bishop Auger Beauvoir. Um, he is the Executive Director of Food for the Poor Haiti. Um, Bishop Auger, Food for the Poor has been in, in, in Haiti since 1986 and, and obviously seen a lot of different challenges uh, over the past 30 years. Can you talk a little bit about Food for the Poor's history in Haiti uh, and how you uh, at Food for the Poor are planning emergency food deliveries in the context of COVID-19? For the Poor has been working in Haiti since 1986. 
It will be 34 years this year. Food for the poor is involved in uh, food distribution, also in uh, agriculture, in fishing. We also distribute uh, medicines, medical equipments, and medical supplies. Uh, right now, Haiti is facing a deadly combination of uh, COVID-19 and uh, hunger, food insecurity, which is a deadly combination for Haiti. The way that we are working these days, and uh, I say for the last five years, we have a network of uh, distribution centers in the regions. Right now, Food for the Poor has two main warehouses in Haiti, one in Port-au-Prince, one in Caracol, in the Northeast. And uh, 10 distribution centers organized with the churches. Eight of, eight of them are in partnership with the Roman Catholic dioceses across the country, one with the Protestant churches and one with the Episcopal Church. Even though those centers are run by the churches, everybody is served. It doesn't matter which, if you are Christian or not. Also, we are serving not only the parishes and the churches, but also community organizations. Those community organizations get their food and other goods from the centers run by the churches. And uh, it is excellent because, you know, the churches are everywhere in Haiti. They are in cities, in towns, in the villages, and way up in the mountains. We have that network that where they help us to distribute food and all the goods. And uh, those people receive goods every two months. We love to sell them every month, but we don't have the means to do it. Every two months, those organizations, churches, parishes, we sell their goods. And during COVID-19, we are getting some extra money from our Food for the Poor in Florida. We use that money to buy extra food locally to help our people to serve more people. We are serving institutions through those distribution centers. But on our main compound in Port-au-Prince, we won a canteen, a feeding program, where we feed 900 families every day, plus students, children from two schools, and patients from three hospitals in the neighborhood. We're also feeding 1,020 children, malnourished children, breastfeeding mothers who are suffering from malnutrition, and pregnant women suffering of malnutrition. Every week, we feed 1,020 1, of them, and 900 families every day. With COVID-19, we cannot continue to cook for them. What we do, we organize dry distribution of food for them. And to come, we get that organized. Every two weeks, we give them food to take home. They can, cooking, they can cook for themselves. At our feeding program, we are buying vegetables from one of our beneficiaries with RCCO, an organization called Afeneg Combi. We are buying other ingredients and vegetables from them for the cooking program that we have just to make sure that uh, those beneficiaries, those partners, because we are not only feeding, but we're also, we're also involved in uh, agriculture. We provide uh, farmers with tools, with agronomists and uh, to train them. Also, we, we provide them with equipment. We give them what they need to farm, to, to, to do farming. We're also involved in animal husbandry. We have uh, boilers, layers, we are in fishing. And at this particular time with COVID-19, what we've been talking about at Food for the Poor in Florida and in Haiti, we said we may have the money, but not able to get supplies. So we are putting a lot of emphasis these days on how to empower our farmers, our fishermen, to do farming, to get involved more in the business of fishing. 
five cents. We were consuming seven containers of beans every month. Right now, we're talking to a group of farmers, how can give them what they need, the technical support, equipment they need, and to empower them to produce the beans that we buy from them. We're also talking to those producing rice in Artibonit Valley. We met with two groups already, how we can buy from them. At the same time, we know it could be more expensive, but at the same time, the quality is not always there. We are trying to see how we can empower them. You can improve the quality of their product and buy from them. And uh, so we will use our network. We are all over the country in the 10 geographic departments. Our main partners are the churches, Roman Catholic Church, Protestant churches, Episcopal churches. They are all over the country. We use them, we reach out to them, and there are those doing the individual distribution. We are also buying if when we get extra money, like we said, we've just got extra money from our main office from Florida, that allows us to serve, to serve another 4,000 families. We are buying locally, and the big challenge now is how to accompany the farmers to put them into, in co-ops, to empower them, provide them with technical support, equipment, what they need, market assessment and everyone they can produce because COVID-19 may be there for a long period of time. And parts may be, may be shut off, you know, or may be closed. We should be able to feed our people. And Food for the Poor is ready to accompany our farmers to get that done. I think I'm going to use my five minutes. Great use of, of the five minutes, Bishop uh, Auger. And I, and I would just like to say, you know, it's great and very encouraging to hear that you've quickly adjusted um, to the realities of COVID-19 and are still distributing food to, to people in need. I think that's, <clears throat> it's so essential that we find solutions that work under the current context when people can't eat in, in you know, one location. Um, and also it's, it's really encouraging to hear of, of the desire and, and you know, efforts you have made to source locally. I'm sure a number of folks on this call will, will likely uh, be reaching out to, to pursue some of those opportunities, you know, pending if, if the quality and, and um, consistency is there. So thank you for, for, for that. Um, to stay on track, um, we'd next like to move on to, to um, Timote George, uh, the executive director of the Smallholder Farmers Alliance and Hugh Locke, the president of the Smallholder Farmers Alliance. Timote, um, it would be great if you could give us a, a quick background on the Smallholder Farmers Alliance, uh, as well as your ideas of, of what is needed now. Um, and, and, and you had some, some um, yeah, great points of, of kind of the step-by-step -step process you envision um, to, to attack this problem now. So Timote, over to you, please. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for this uh, gathering. So the Small the Farmers Alliance is a Haitian foundation working in Haiti on um, reforestation primarily. But uh, in order to do that, we do agricultural service, animal husbandry, a microcredit program to uh, women farmers, and um, also recently agribusiness. But the core activity is really reforestation. So I would like to, to propose uh, some practical steps uh, um, as a way to face the situation that uh, is coming very soon, which is the food crisis in Haiti. So you all know why we have this situation and we know the last year situation in Haiti and what we are having now. So these are the reasons why we are afraid of a very severe food crisis in the country. So one, one thing to do is um, to produce food. And when producing food always, people think about industrialization. So now I'm proposing to put the focus on the people. Um, it's an emergency, we cannot do something for long term, but immediately, right now, we need to produce some food and should be 
uh, as fast as possible, and agriculture can do it. Um, I would propose right now a, a strategic partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture and um, to do a zoning and see uh, what are the key agricultural regions of the country, what are the short harvest crops that used to resist to uh, local climate stress, and um, what crops are already familiar to the uh, farmers and also that adapt to the zone. And um, this should be very short harvest crops like um, that can give food within uh, three months. Um, and second, it will be to, to see in case where these regions have shortage of uh, rain, so what are the existing irrigation systems in these places? And choose to repair the easiest ones. For example, I, I used to see uh, farmers plot um, that is close to a river for less than 500 meters, but the land is being useless because there is no rain, but there's a permanent river at less than 500 meters. So it does not cost millions to get the water to this farmer's land. So in, terms of, in, in this situation of emergency, uh, a situation like, like that should be addressed in order to get the water to the farmer's land, whether by digging a canal or using a water pump, so by any way it can happen without uh, a lot of um, uh, effort. So third thing would be to have a team that knows Haiti's farming realities, um, human resources, a team that can really depart to uh, each of these um, agricultural regions to establish demo plots for purpose of training. And, uh, you know, farmers in Haiti only get convinced by seeing. The uh, thing would be to, to get a market ready that can purchase the extra product after harvest and so that we don't have uh, post-harvest uh, waste. And uh, I, I was, very excited to hear some partners here have really purchased stuff from farmers in Haiti. So uh, the basic is already here. And then the fifth thing to do is a sustainability plan. So the sustainability plan, after responding to the urgence of this moment, uh, the partners should build a steering committee or a small team of uh, uh, interested uh, people that will continue by developing regional cooperatives with participating um, uh, farmers. And this team will make sure that uh, local people can take full responsibility of these uh, cooperatives. And as soon they see that, they can um, reduce uh, or they can step back and let local people continue owning these cooperatives so that they can have the food by, for themselves and keep um, producing and selling to other part of the country. So it seems uh, very complicated, but it's uh, with uh, volunteer we can do that uh, like uh, within a year. Uh, and uh, the impacts can be seen within some months. So we only have to have the right partners, strategic partners to do that. And have the people, um, uh, local people be on board with that. Thank you.
Thank you, Timothée, and, and, and very much appreciate and, and you know, agree with your very practical steps, particularly around you know, increasing production now and, and being targeted. And I think it sounds like it's a combo of, of focusing on the urgent needs as well as you know, the crops that have markets uh, as well, uh, so that the, there is a sustainability plan. Um, Hugh, this kind of dovetails well into um, some of the things we've been talking about and, and you know, the creation and the linkage between community food banks and, and the idea of new community food banks with local seed banks and, and tying the two together um, as much as possible. It'd be great if you could talk a bit about that and, and um, the latest ideas as well as you know, how best to integrate this work into the Ministry of Agriculture in Haiti. Thanks, Rob. Well, we're, we're at a difficult juncture right now because you can see just from this call, there are so many resources um, on the table. There are so many organizations that are approaching this from a very um, creative perspective. They're moving past the normal boundaries of operation in order to just respond to a pending emergency. Early in my career, I used to organize large um, events, mostly with heads of state, presidents, prime ministers, etc. And what I found was that you do all the preparation, you line everything up, and then the event starts, and every part of the organization from that point onwards has to work independently because the pressure is so great I used to organize them, I mean, as many as, as 50 heads of state at once. So you can imagine all the security forces and everything. It, it it's, was an interesting process. But that need to plan, and then the ability of the, of the parts to operate in tandem once the event began has always stayed with me. And I think that there's an application of that right now in Haiti. We know that something major beyond possibly even our capacity to anticipate is about to uh, hit the country. We know that there are many different organizations and institutions who are addressing this, but what I feel is missing is a way to take an overview of everything that's going on all the resources um, and an organizational capacity that's focused on this and be able to come up with some kind of comprehensive plan that doesn't infringe on any individual organizations or institutions, um, area of expertise or funding or anything else. But typically what happens in Haiti is that once a major event happens, cholera. There are institutional anchor points for coordination that become completely, and I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I mean just realities talking here, they become completely dysfunctional because they get so overloaded with uh, bureaucracy that they are unable to step back and allow a natural process of coordination to take place. I feel that we are at the point where we could anticipate that and avoid it. I don't know where the natural landing place is for this coordination within the people who are, are you know, signed on today to this Zoom call. It could be that ACTED has a, a larger role. It could be that there's an alliance that involves WFP and Food for the Poor and others. But so I don't have an answer. I would just like to put it out there that I think that we need to step beyond the normal bounds of, of organizational um, coordination and move to a different place, both so that we can respond to the current crisis, but also that we can avoid the traditional. Um, gap between emergency response and long-term recovery. Because if we don't integrate those in Haiti now, 
we are going to face the same um, dichotomy later on, that the two get separated. And you lose the energy and the coordination and the spirit of collaboration that happens at the time of a crisis, and it can't be continued in a way that takes that energy and, and moves it into long-term um, capacity. And so I'm also wanting to suggest that, that we keep in mind, and to, to Rob's point, we're, we're very interested in how do you connect emergency food response with um, reinforcing the idea of both community seed banks and community food banks. Surely the two can be connected, as uh, Bishop Ode was, was referring to earlier. I think that that sort of connection is there and ready to be made. Um, I don't have the answer. I would just like to put it out to the group that between us, surely we can figure out something that takes us to the next level of coordination among the NGOs and institutions, brings in the ministries um, to give them a, a clear and distinct role, but does not depend on the ministries to take the lead. We always want to be respectful of their absolute centrality in this process, but we can't assume that they have that capacity right now, and they certainly don't have the funding. Um, so that's what I would like to put out to the group. <laughs> Thank you. Hugh, I think you raise a lot of important points. And I think, you know, this is a great discussion because it, it does appear that we have um, folks from all different angles of this challenge on the line, from those who feed, the, those who support farmer organizations, those that aggregate and sell. And I think it's, it's the start of, of many conversations to try and connect these dots a bit better. Um, so, so, and I think it does take you know, the diverse set of, of players that we have here. So, so thank you for those, those words and, and wholeheartedly agree. Um, next, in, in, in the interest of time and saving some time for, for the Q&A and discussion, um, I'd like to pass it over to a good friend, Herville Cherubin, uh, who's the country director for Heifer International. Um, Herville, could you talk to us a little bit about what you guys are doing um, and, and kind of your, your holistic uh, approach to, to farming communities? Okay, uh, but we at Heifer, but well, Heifer has been in Haiti for for a while now, for more than 20 years, we've been working with different communities and in agriculture, we're well known for uh, livestock and in community development. Uh, well, the one thing I'm seeing, and I've spent a lot of time thinking this week, is our COVID have been teaching us a lot of lessons. And particularly in Haiti, one of the lessons we are, uh, we are one of the things we are learning is how, uh, how big is the gap between the rural communities and the, the urban communities. So when you look at the, uh, the rural communities right now, you can see they're completely left alone in Haiti. I've seen some, you know, some interviews from different uh, people in different communities to see how those people, they're completely left alone. And actually, they cannot do it by themselves. They cannot do it by themselves. So at Heifer, we used to say for a while that we work in agriculture. But many years, some years ago, we realized we were, instead of being in the business of agriculture, we were in the business of community development. Because when you go to the rural areas, it's not only about agriculture. It's about health. It's about education, it's about, about water, it's about wood, it's about a lot of things. So what, what we've been pushing for a while, it's a different model, community uh, development model, mostly more holistic community development model. But you know, one of the things is that most of our organization are set to work is in one or two things. You know, we are not set to work like, you know, and as in our case, you know, we don't do a lot of education activities. We don't do a lot of help activities. But we try to create this a synergy, the platform for the people to do that. And I think this is what is really needed right now. We're talking about community banks. We've been doing that. It's good. Community like food banks, all those things are very important. But with COVID, we find out those people, most of those people, they don't even have information about if they're sick, you know, they don't have a hospital. They don't have a clinic. I don't know if you ever visited some kind of clinics or, or, 
or health center in those communities. So when we want the farmer to produce, we want the farmer to produce in some really good conditions. If so something happened, they need to have a good health center at least, you know, to take care of a wound or something like that. They want to have some really good school for their kids. You know, they want education and they want some leadership training. They, they want a lot of stuff. And I think this is where we usually try to focus. And I think it's really good that all of us are talking here right now. We're talking about agriculture. For many years, I think agriculture is what's only about agriculture. But in Haiti, when we talk to rural communities, the farming communities, we're not talking only about agriculture because those people, they don't have the basic the other basic thing to next. And it's very interesting. Now everybody is seeing, since the DR is closed, the border is practically closed, we're not getting a lot of food from different places. Suddenly, the farmers in Haiti have become essentials. <laughs> but they're essentials without any, <laughs> you know, with, with, with no health capacity. If they're sick, no, God forbid. If COVID moves fast in the rural area, it's going to be a disaster because those people are not equipped. So my point here, I don't want to take much more time. It's about when we talk about like agriculture, when we talk about, talk about most rural communities in Haiti are farming communities. You know, they are not other things. They are just farming communities, except for some few places, talking about Caracol, where they're trying to put some industries but most rural communities in Haiti are farming communities. So that means we need to find a ways to equip those farming communities with basic things, you know, with, with markets, with education, with uh, good health centers, you know, with wood to, you know, in order to have access to, to, to the market or to the, to the urban areas and also to, you know, to access to water. Most of those people, they don't have those things. So guys, we cannot talk about like, a better farming production in Haiti or having the folks in the rural communities living a better life if we cannot provide them all of them. So we need to get together, need to think about those type of things in order to make their life much better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javier. And, and just to add to that, you know, we, we work in a few countries, um, Colombia, El Salvador, Haiti, and what we've seen is COVID-19 has really shown the importance of local supply chains and local farmers. And yes. while you know, most people have, are, are, are working from home and the economy is shut down in a lot of these countries, farming continues um, and farmers are still out there working, um, which, which really highlights the importance of, of a sector that has been forgotten and neglected. Um, so, so I think that's a huge, huge point. Um, in, in, in terms of, of uh, next steps and, and kind of the discussion moving forward, um, there've been a few comments and questions that have come in and I wanna jump into those um, you know, very briefly in a second. I do feel, and, and I think the group, uh, you know, what I'm hearing is that this is a conversation um, that needs to continue um, and needs to continue with specific focus in certain areas. Um, I think generally speaking, um, we, we know as Marianne suggested earlier uh, or mentioned earlier, um, Haiti is underfunded right now um, and undersupported. So for us to get the most out of our, our resources, our footprints, our expertise, we have to work together. Um, and again, I think, you know, the perfect marriage um, uh, of partners really is, you know, those that are consuming and buying, those that are supporting and those that can get that product to market. Uh, and it really will take the three. Um, so jumping into a few of the, the questions and, and comments, um, I know there have been several questions and comments around um, connecting the, the, the dots between supply that's available locally and demand that's, that's there. Um, George Sassine had, had a, 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 a comment on that um, as well as some, some follow-ups from Mary McLaughlin at, at Trees That Feed. Um, I, I do think we, we should set up a, a, a list of, of um, basically suppliers and, and potential interest in buyers, and we will follow up on this call to, to start that database so that we can start developing, uh, again, a list of, of who's out there supplying and what they have and how often they have it and the quality and the pricing. Um, as well as the products that are in need by WFP, as well as um, uh, Food for the Poor. Um, and, and another question that came in from, from Zami Agricol, from, from Jilen, um, is just uh, you know, asking about uh, availability of seeds and, and anyone that has extra availability of seeds 
um, to, to, to do planting at this point. Um, again, I think that could be followed up. Um, I, I don't know if we have, we can turn on the, the participants to respond. Uh, so it'll just be the panelists at this point. Um, but I think that's, a, that's something we can follow up as well um, and put in our, our questionnaire out to those that have attended. Um, any, any panelists would like to, to add to, to, to a comment on that of availability of seed that they have? So it will depend on what varieties, what type of seeds. At some seasons, uh, we used to have like black bean seeds available. So uh, you can email me and ask specifically what kind of seeds you want. So we can work on that. At Food for the Poor, we're getting seeds also from uh, our office from Florida. But if you are talking about beans or vegetables or corns, we are ready to welcome them. But uh, as a, except we don't receive uh, the GMO seeds. Okay, I think that that conversation can also be taken um, as a as a follow up item that we can we can check on availability and those seeds being sought. We we have three quick minutes to finish up, um, and 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 I think the the questions that are coming through are more focusing on follow up sessions and specific topics. So so with that, maybe we do a quick um, you know one minute uh, per panelist to say any any closing remarks or anything they'd like to add to 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 sign off. So so with that, Hugh, would you like to to start? Yes, I, I'm just wondering if one of the practical next steps could be to start a very simple mapping of who's doing what in Haiti in the, because obviously our focus in this is smallholder farmers. And as Erville rightly pointed out, they're the ones who've been abandoned. The rural communities have been abandoned. And so if we could do a very simple mapping and, and maybe work with Marion on this, um, to be able to say, okay, here are the, I don't know, 25 organizations that are that currently have a footprint in the um, the smallholder farming sector, and um, where are they focused? What's what services are they providing, and where do they have any flexibility? As an example, um, the Smallholder Farmers Alliance has been talking with both um, Assesso and um, Heifer International to figure out for our next locations, because we are in the process of expanding in Haiti, um, could we coordinate and choose next locations where we can converge? So that as Erville pointed out, we need to be looking at community development, not just um, farmer support. And so how can we converge on communities moving forward to be able to bring in as many resources as possible and address um, the, the challenge in rural Haiti at a community level, not at a farmer level. Great, thank you, Hugh, for that. And and any of the other panelists, you know, hearing um, any of the questions or or just comments from from the other panelists, would like to make any any closing remarks before we sign off. Bishop Oje, it seems like yes, you would. If, yes, if I may, I did the talk at the very beginning about uh, the housing involvement of food for the poor. We used to do, we are still doing single housing, single homes, but for the last four years, we have been involved in community building, community, planned communities with a component of community development. Under the leadership of uh, local leaders and uh, local uh, managers in the members of beneficiaries from the homes, we put there water for them to drink, a community development project, we do capacity building, and we, go to, we build them and we have them for five years. We empower them to do, we have projects like our, not only housing, but also agriculture, fishing in some cases, uh, bees, and animal husbandry, we empower them. And in five years, we pull out. We are already involved in community development. We, we are looking for partners how to strengthen that. But I uh, would like to get some people working with us to give a better uh, community and work to the people who are serving. Great. And I, and I think that's a, the, another focus area. I mean, I think we have a few different tangible 
focus groups that we can convene, um, those working in supply, those working kind of on the demand side and distribution. Um, but I think this specific topic of community-led development um, and, and specifically around agriculture is, is particularly relevant. So I think that would be another good follow-up focus group um, for a subset of this, uh, this call to, to speak to and, and talk about what's worked and what hasn't worked and, and how we can combine efforts. So thank you for that, Bishop uh, Ogier. Raphael, uh, yeah, a, a closing thought yeah, on your just side. A very quick, um, uh, just to follow up on, on the concern of you about uh, the, the mapping of the interventions. Uh, there is just to, for, as a reminder, there is the um, uh, food security sector, which is a platform where the government, the, um, the United Nations agencies, and uh, mm -hmm. NGOs, national and international. Uh, meet to, um, to to discuss about the food security cluster and usually makes the nexus between the emergency food assistance also with the rural development. So it, it's it's a, it's an interesting platform to discuss these uh, these topics. It doesn't gather all the existing information with all the. Um, the, the small farmers association, but it gives you a, a, a mapping of existing um, interventions in the in the country and all the discussion going on with um, the good technique de sécurité alimentaire (GTSAN) led by by the CNSA National Coordination for the Food Security. Also, you can find a lot of information about uh, the current intervention. Uh, through the website of OCHA and the Humanitarian Response Plans, which indicates all the work done uh, for humanitarian response as well as livelihood support. Well, thank you, uh, that's super helpful, Raphael. We'll make sure that that gets, gets out to the group. And Marion had, had one more um, remark as well to, to, to conclude with. Marion, over to you. Yes, to complement what Rafael was saying, um, also in Haiti, as part of the CLIO, so the NGO Forum, we have a commission that is specialized on agriculture and environment. The commission is open to non-members of the CLIO. Uh, and this commission is, is much more development oriented uh, with a lot of grassroots agricultural organizations. So I would also invite actors who are interested uh, to join this group, uh, I'll share the email address uh, so they can uh, come to the meetings. But indeed, as mentioned by uh, you, I think it's, uh, it's very important that we bridge this gap between those two types of actors because even uh, me as acted, I realized that there are a lot of actors today, panelists, that I don't know, but they haven't met, uh, although I've been spending like, uh, some time here. So it's really important that we continue this discussion and, uh, and we exchange uh, on our respective programs and how you know, we can mutualize and coordinate much better. Thank you very much, Marianne. And, and we are about five minutes over, so I, I, I do think we should close the call. Uh, I think this is a, a very important first step, but I think it, you know, like all calls, it's really the action list after the calls that um, you know, turn this into something of substance. Um, for the, the comments and other Q&A, apologies if we didn't get to your, your comment or question, um, but we will take those into consideration and, and make sure they get responded to um, or are incorporated into the working sessions that, that we propose to host after this event. Um, and, and one last thing, I think, you know, these types of crises often, um, you know, can be looked at in a, a glass half empty or glass half full. I think this creates a huge opportunity for local sourcing, similarly with the depreciation of the gourd. Um, you know, we have to take advantage of, of the opportunities um, as well as tackle the challenges. So I, I think this is, a, again, a very, very good first conversation of, of many to come to try and connect the dots a little bit better and, and, and create economic opportunity as well as um, get people fed. Um, so thank you all for joining the call. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you um, to, to Hugh and, and the Smallholder Farmers Alliance and Timote uh, for, for putting together most of the agenda. Uh, and, and thank you so much, Bettina and the Haiti Action Network and Clinton Foundation uh, team for, for hosting. So with that, thank you and, and everyone enjoy the rest of your day.